Hello, readers. Welcome to the special edition of 20 Questions with your favorite author. I'm Kelly Lee Colby, Editorial Director at Curse Dragon Trip Publishing. Today, we celebrate the release of Leather and Sage, book one in the Willow Moss and Kipling series by debut author Taylor Shepard. We also have a treat of S.G. George, the editor from Lady Bird Editing, reading as well. If you see Pebbles Gray as Thunder, leave as red as the setting sun, run. Always run. evening. I feel like so happy and it's the middle of the day and it's sun shining and we're talking about such a dark book today. <laughs> this should be fun. So Taylor, are you ready? How do you feel about the, your first book's birthday? I am beyond excited. <laughs> Got a little cake and everything. Yes. Did you make it or did you buy it? No, I definitely bought it. Yeah. Definitely bought it this time. Yeah. yeah. I know you, you like to bake for stress, right? I do. I do stress bake. But instead of stress baking today, I put up Christmas decorations because I'm one of those people. Yes. So then I ran to the store and bought cake. That's right. <laughs> I shall have cake. I must celebrate. Exactly. Awesome. So, Birdie. So we call Birdie uh, S.G. George here, our awesome editor who was brave enough to tackle this book. How are you this, this afternoon, I guess? Oh, I think we might be having technical difficulties. Because that's fun. This is what happens when you do live TV, people. I know. It works beforehand, and then it breaks when you go live. Right. Yes, uh, Zafo is shaking his fist at all the things that don't want to cooperate. Well, hold on, Sarah. (laughs) We'll get right back to you, because we definitely want to hear from you, because it's awesome. So, Taylor, tell us a little bit about this novel. So, we are calling it a paranormal horror, Yes. Exactly. Yes. So, so a little, go ahead. Oh, a little bit about this novel. Um, it takes place in what I would like to consider old Louisiana, post Annabelle, Louisiana, and we come in with the Orchard Clan, um, which is a part of the larger coven. And it's really a story between two sisters. There are three sisters, but it's the two who are our main POV characters. Um, one of them is struggling to protect her family, to save her mother from a spirit, while also trying to ensure that she keeps the clan safe from the Forsaken. And the Forsaken is her other sister, who has enacted the Bloodbred Curse. And so you kind of get these two POVs that are really struggling not only to find their place in the world, but also to save themselves and the people around them. And there are monsters. (laughs) Yes, yes, they are monsters. Well, I love that because you have the whole family dynamic going on where they're trying to be, you know, what they're supposed to be. And and, and your your um, main character, Ellie, is doing everything she can to be the good big sister and to take care of everyone. And no matter what she does, it just all goes wrong anyways. Yep, I really just let her hit rock bottom over and over and over again. That's what oh. happens to good characters. Well, you know, it's just, it's, it's like horribly mean, but nevertheless, I mean, <laughs> without stuff happening, what are we reading about, right? That's true. No conflict, no plot. That's right. <laughs> what are the first <laughs> lessons? Yes, if a reader's ever, ever reading it and they're like, um, nothing's happening. Yeah, that's because the writer's being way too nice to their reader. Taylor yep. does, or to their characters. Taylor, Taylor doesn't have that problem. No. I have yeah. the opposite problem. That's right. That's right. I don't know. I Maybe it's a, a, because of your day job as a teacher, you just have to like take it out on your fictional characters. Yeah, that's just how I, uh, it's therapeutic <laughs> for me. <laughs> <laughs> People are always like, can you write me into your novels? Can you write me into my stories? And I'm like, I don't know that you actually <laughs> want that. You don't know. Like what you've you listened to what I write. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, um, We met uh, Birdie on Twitch. So let's see. I wonder if she's still. Um, And so I saw her. She is on Twitch all the time. And she does editing live. Talk about Bray. What do you think about that, Taylor? Um, I could never. (laughs) No, right? So Birdie was brave enough to do some editing live. And I was like, you know what? I really like her style. I think maybe she could be awesome for this. And then what did I do, Birdie? 
And then you messaged me and you were like, you want something that is in English? And I said, yes, please. <laughs> and then I sent her something kind of in English. Yeah, it was, it was, <laughs> it was sort of English. And then it's, I don't know. Should I talk about the style? Does anybody else want to talk? Are we going to address the style? The style? Oh, no, you are, definitely talk about the style. The style is important because I'll tell you now, the story is is pretty straightforward, except it's compelling as I'll get out. But it's the style that makes it very unique. So I'll tell you early readers, some of them have loved it. And they're like, this is amazing. I had to get used to it. But once I did, I could not stop reading. And others like, oh, I don't know. It's not quite for me. So it depends on if when you read those first chapters and you're like, I am so intrigued by this society and these people and what they're doing. And the language is part of the setting. So it, explain to me, why, why did you choose that kind of language, Taylor? Um, well, I could give you the like fun, nice author story. I could give you the actual story. I don't know if the actual story is okay. I don't know. So I don't know I was what watching. It is. I can't tell you if it's okay or not. I don't know what it is. Sarah's like, I don't know. Should I edit it first? Hold on. Let's do the slides. <laughs> we'll see. No, I'll just go with the real story. And then if you're like, no more, I'll be like, all right, that's fine. So I was watching um, Supernatural because who doesn't watch Supernatural? Right. If you don't watch Supernatural, you can just go ahead and hop off. It's fine. Whatever. Um, but I was watching one of the ones with the Crossroads Demons for like the 15th time. And I was a glass of bourbon in. And I was like, you know what? I really think that I want to write like a post antebellum jazz story, something like that. And so I wrote a short story that I actually submitted based on this world. Um, that's very different from the characters that are now in it, submitted that to a magazine and an anthology here in Houston. And that got published and then decided, well, you know what, I'm going to write a lot of short stories based on this world and put them all together. And then from that, Sent this to Kelly. Kelly was like, oh my gosh, I love it so much, but not as is. <laughs> I need you to take it apart and destroy it and then give me a novel. But it was kind of that wanting to go to that time period and understanding that that time period in this location, they're not going to speak the way that we do. So getting that authenticity. Um, and for some reason, it was a lot easier to do that with a glass of bourbon in me than it is <laughs> when I don't have that glass of bourbon. <laughs> like the voice came so much easier like that. We should see. So how, how many glasses of bourbon did you have to drink, Sarah, while you were editing it? None. Um, but so the, the style is very unique. And there's a lot of dropped letters. Like the words are not spelled the same. Words are flipped. And grammatical construction is a little bit weird. Um, and that's just like the character who speaks actual English. There's the point of view goes from the main character. I can't remember her name. The the older Ellie, girl. Ellie, Ellie. Mm -hmm. and her little sister. Don't say her name. It's okay. Keep going. The Forsaken. The, yeah, the Forsaken. forsaken because oh, okay. they have to figure out which one it is. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Well, then I will stop spoiling the book. Um, and <laughs> so the a large point a part of the the book is spent in a child's head who has not gone to like school and so she does not speak proper english at all and so that was an interesting thing to edit like because as a editor my job is to make sure that the book is interesting but also it's legible because a it doesn't matter how good your story is if your character or if your reader can't read it and so it's my job to make sure that your book is it's charming and it's cool and it's great but also like there's just enough proper English in there for it to be legible mm -hmm. I was going somewhere with this and I forgot no you so actually covered it all how exactly. difficult was it for you to make my book legible <laughs> so the <laughs> It was a lot easier once I got about four paragraphs into the Forsaken's um chapter the first Forsaken chapter and then I gave up <laughs> like, well, so, there's a so, rhythm to it. Yeah. Well, so there's a the, rhythm. The, so once the you big, find that, it works. Yeah. The big thing is um, the verbs aren't conjugated, and so mm -hmm. with Ellie, like every 
eighth verb wasn't conjugated. That was easy to fix. The forsaken, all of her verbs aren't properly con. And it's a coin flip. It's a coin flip as to whether it is or not. And so once I realized that and I was like, okay, well, we're going to fix one and not the other. My job got so much easier. Yep. yep. <laughs> and it made Good. sense. I love hearing your side of it. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, we learned so much by doing this, though. It's so much fun. But I'm not kidding. It's been a really long time because, quite frankly, all books, they just, they're all written the same. <laughs> like, yeah. it's like, we want to hear the author's voice. I'm like, how can you tell? It's all the same. <laughs> this one, no, you have a very distinct and beautiful voice because not only do you have the unique dialect, right? So that takes some getting used to. The part that doesn't take getting used to is the way you describe things, the way you set up emotionally what's going to happen. All of those kind of things that just drag you in where you really care about these characters. And it, it's just incredible how you do that. So I'm wondering, like, when you do these horrible things to these characters, does it actually hurt you? Because, you know, it hurts me a little. <laughs> I, it does, but I always want it to be, like, poetic in a way, if that makes sense. And I don't know, I keep going back to TV shows. I don't know if anybody has watched The Haunting of Hill House. It's yes. one of my favorite television series, or I think it's going to be a series, but television shows. And there's the part at the end where... The mom and one of the ghosts is talking, the redhead. I'm not going to say their names, no, I'm not going to say what they're talking about. But the way that they're conversing with one another is just so beautiful and so poetic and so filled with emotion. And I like to try and take that that you can see on screen and that you can hear in their tone and write it in a way where if you're reading and it's just ink, I mean, that's all that a book is. It's ink that's formed words. But I want you to be able to get that picture and to get that tone and see it when you're reading. And so that's what I really, it hurts, but I also want it to be beautiful in a way. Well, it is, I have to say, it's incredible. Um, let's see, we have in the comments, we have Karina. They say that they've already, uh, they're already waiting for book two. So, and they said the language <laughs> is poetic and beautiful and it is, it definitely is. And Pine Lord says authentic old style writing. You had, you had my attention, but now you have my interest. So it's very, very cool. Um, I do recommend um, we have the link in the chat um, and we will have the link in the notes if you are you know, listening to this in your podcast or watching on YouTube where you can go click and go look. Read the first few pages. It's available on that early look thing, whatever it's called on Amazon. Read the first few pages. It's beautiful. And also in this book, which I had a lot of fun making all of the little drawings. Did you see those in the book, Taylor? I did. I was flipping through it. That was a surprise. I was like, ah. Oh. I did. It was so much fun. Yes. Well, because there are the one thing, see, Sarah didn't get to see is that we have pul no, you didn't get to see these. I'm sorry. They're poultices. So poultices, because oh. remember, these are witches. Mm -hmm. So, you know, get, they go through and they and they have they do their they do poultices for different things. You'll see some in the book. There are some used in the book. And uh, Taylor made some very creative recipes for these poultices. Where did you come up with these ideas? Um, it was just kind of a mismatch of all of the, you know, because I've been interested in this type of world since I was younger. So all of the stuff that I've read and previously come into contact with and then just buying, honestly, herbology books online and seeing what different recipes do and then seeing like in the witchy books um, what different things mean. I know that I messed up on a couple of them because I was talking to my friend and she was like, this is not what this crystal means. And I was like, oh, oops, <laughs> educate me, educate me so that I can do it better later. <laughs> well, the thing to remember is you have actual witches and forsaken in your world. Um, I'm gonna cross my fingers anywhere that we don't in this world. So, you know, the crystals can be a little different. So it's fun to do that. Now all you have to do is make sure it's consistent through your series. Yes, exactly. So, but they were, they were a lot of fun to write because you get to be creative. And then all of the poultices, because like I mentioned earlier, this was not the original text that I sent to Kelly. So all of the poultices that are there now are poultices that are mentioned within the book. In other words, there are more and they're so exciting. Um, but don't, don't think you can make them on your own because there's things like, you know, sunlight right after it sets. <laughs> Web of I a nightmare. That. Yes, yes. It's just, it's so incredible. It just, it adds to that magic. So you'll, you'll see those throughout the, the novel as well. Um, it's like just a little bit of art just in the middle. It's fun. Um, yeah, Sarah, maybe next time I'll have to send those to you too. 
Yeah. We'll have to send you a copy of the book so you can see all your gorgeous work. I would love a signed copy. I You can't see it. And I'm not going to turn my camera because it's <laughs> dirty over there. Um, but <laughs> I have a shelf that I made in middle school and on it are the books that I edited because before this, like I was editing from published novels. Like I have paper copies of all the books that I hand went and made notes in and then had the authors give back to me because I think they're really cool. And so I've got edited versions and clean versions up on my shelf over there. And so I would love to, like one of, one of the things is I want to get books from all of the editor or all of the authors that I edit and put them on the shelf. Yes, that definitely. That's so cool. That is cool. No, we were so lucky to find you. Yeah, Sarah's going to be working for us like all year. So you're going to see her a lot on these things. So it's going to be exciting. I hope so. Yeah, because Kelly and I talked a lot. Kelly was like, we have to find someone special to edit your book. And I was like, I know. <laughs> and we did. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> well, Sarah, if anyone is looking for you to edit, um, where can they find you? Ladybirdediting at gmail.com. Just send me an email because I don't have a website up yet. Um, just send me an email. Like I saw you on Curse Dragon Ship Publishing. Um, tell me about yourself. Tell me about your whatever you're working on. Um, or you can follow me on Twitch. I am twitch.tv backslash birdie25. Um, and you can catch me there three times a week. Two times a week I do editing or writing based content. And then Wednesday is an art night. Ooh, I haven't done Wednesdays. That's fun. And it's Birdie, B-I-R-D-E-E, -E, 25. So Yes. E-E-E. E-E-E. -E. No, two E's. I said E three times. E, it just three times just sounded better. See, it's about yeah. the rhythm, right, Taylor? <laughs> well, and there, there is a whole and thing about rule of threes. <laughs> and the bourbon. <laughs> I mean, let's not lie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, witches, I'm telling you. I don't know. I mean, it could be fun to hang out with them. So you have um, this one, the one that's featured, the clan in this one. So you have a, a overall um, coven, yes. right? So the coven is big picture. So who's in the coven? Like, what, what does that mean? Coven is big. So you have the 12 clans in the coven. You have the Orchard Clan, which is who this book is based on. Um, and then you have the Blackwoods. The Blackwoods are the head of the coven. So every clan has a matriarch, and they're in charge of that little clan. So for the Orchard, Ellie's mother is the matriarch. For the Mangroves clan, they have a different matriarch who's in charge of that clan. But the Blackwoods are the head of the snake, essentially. And so their matriarch is also what they call the matron. And she's in charge of everything, which means that if somebody in the clan, it's, it's a government, really, mm -hmm. is kind of what it is. And so if anybody in any of the other clans um, does something wrong or comes across something that would potentially help the entire coven, they answer to the matron. Now, the orchard is in a different situation because they've been exiled. Which is not a spoiler because you find it out in the prologue. Um, but they kind of work on the outskirts of the actual coven. In book two, we're focused on the Blackwoods. So we move to the head of the snake in book two. It'll be fun. It'll be interesting seeing, uh, seeing the true political games that get played. And this one, just like it, when you explained the beginning, the... the basically a short story collection you sent me, right? So they have, as they, it goes up in generations. So the, the next one, is this one farther in the future than this one? It's going to be about 55 years. Okay. So Leather and Sage future. takes place around? I would say like a couple years after the Civil War. And that's how so I picture it. By the way, when you read the accent, that'll make, does that make sense, Sarah? I actually thought it was a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. Oh. I could see that, but around that time, right? We all got 1800s in yeah. our head. And definitely, you know, definitely Louisiana is where I saw it too, or very least East Texas, right? Yeah. So, right. And then, so you said the next one is 50 years in the future. So early 1900s? So early 1900s, um, depending on how things go, it might be 1890s. And I'm looking okay. specifically at the politics there and then also the fashion, because I think the 1890s fashion is cool. <laughs> Honestly, like that's part of my decision making. They have cool clothes. <laughs> I mean, if you have 
to write, you might as well get to research stuff you want to, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And then we had the progressive movement and everything. Like, I love history, too. So then I look into all of that. Didn't pull it into book one um, because I felt like it was so much more important to get the world Mm -hmm. set before you pull in the actual politics of the outside world. But now that it's set, I feel like we can really look and see how the outside world impacts the coven. Makes sense. Especially Especially when the first book, they're so isolated. It makes sense not to pull in so much outside. Yeah. And so especially as we move into the future Mm -hmm. um, and get more into modern day times, that's where you really have to coexist with the humans. Kind of hard to hide now. There are not so many, you know, hollows, back places to hide anymore. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Unless you go to Alaska. (laughs) That's true. (laughs) (laughs) But um, yeah. That's awesome. I love it. I'm very excited. Um, Oh, remember, this is just like a normal 20 questions. So if anyone has some questions, please pull them up. Um, We, the, I put up the book launch. So that one is on YouTube too. So if anyone wants to go and look at the awesome cover, but you can see it here as well. Unfortunately, Stephanie saw who does the book covers and was incredible. uh, Did not have, she could not make it tonight. But I do want to point out that the eyes in this book are very important, which is why we featured it. So first, can you tell us what Willow Moss and Kindling means? Why did you choose that for the series title? Um, Willow Moss and Kindling is the color of the witch's eyes. It's a fancy way of saying really that they're green and brown. They're kind of that brown. Well, they're hazel, really. And so Willow Moss and Kindling, because we're pulling from those natural elements that you see around them, specifically around the Orchard Clan. But this is what signifies that you're a witch. It's kind of like their physical marking if you have eyes of willow moss and kindling then you are a witch and you're part of the clan and and so those you know since it represent represents the entire community it just made sense to me to be the series title uh, because that's who these people are that's how we can designate them and then i don't know i just thought it sounded cool yeah no i love it and actually it, it kind of it shows your style too like I said, mm-hmm. you have very poetic style and that's a very poetic way instead of just saying, yeah, they have brown eyes and green in it, you know, flashes every now and again, <laughs> you know, it's like, no, Willow Moss and Kindling. I'm like, what is this? I'm so intrigued. I'm like, <laughs> well, that also goes to the title. So the title of this one is Leather and Sage. So where does that title come from? Um, so this is, I play with scents a lot. If we're thinking about the five senses, mm-hmm. scent is something that pops up a lot. And the main characters who are just witches mention it, but are forsaken, who has a heightened sense of smell. Um, and this is also going to come into play a lot starting really in book three, because something happens in book two. Um, if you could tell, I haven't read book two yet either. I'm so excited. <laughs> um, but this is, this is kind of a marker of you know, she can see better she can hear better but sometimes if you're running through the woods what she gets first is that scent and so leather and sage is kind of what ellie it's what ellie smells like yep and so this is one of the ways her sister recognizes her so exciting let's see pine lord wants to know so if this book became a religion could they take her as the patron saint oh matron Mm -hmm. saint oh i see punny Honey, huh. you got it, did you start it? Matron yes. saint instead of patron saint. I like it. I like it. Quite frankly, um, the witches of the Blackwoods would, would totally take you up on that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They wouldn't mind. You could worship them. That's fine. They like it. They'd be um, okay with it. Yeah, right. They could do that. Jenny would be know, like, why haven't you already? <laughs> you should be already doing this. Uh, Jenny <laughs> wants to know, did you have a favorite poultice? Um, I did have a favorite poultice that actually didn't make it into this book. And it was the poultice. Oh, I forgot what I called it. It was the blessing of youth, I think is what I called it, which sounds really nice, but the ingredients were really horrible. And so I liked that play. Uh, And then of course, this was with the original anthology that I sent to Kelly. So it was short stories, poems, and poultices. And so I also like the way it played with that particular short story because the Blackwoods were realizing that this curse that they help enact that they thought was just affecting the orchard was actually backfiring on them as well. And so then you got this poultice and you could really see how horrible they were based on some of the ingredients like infant skin and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
these via Orchard Clan's much nicer. It's not so bad. Yeah, the Orchard Clan is much nicer. <laughs> yeah, we like the Orchard Clan. Um, <laughs> Kevin Petway says uh, ice cream could be a kind of poultice. Yes. Right? If I that agree. works. I agree. You mix and, and match those ingredients and you have a good time. It could totally work. Just maybe no infant skin. And Gregory <laughs> Little says that a poultice, <laughs> ice cream is a poultice that cures sadness. Yes. Oh, I love that. And then now that we're moving into winter, you can have the ice cream and you can have the hot chocolate. Mm-hmm. Best of both worlds, right? Exactly. Can I tell you, Sarah, you taught us something really cool in your editing that neither yeah. of us knew. And mind you, I am an editor as well. And Taylor teaches English. Neither of us knew this. And that is the apostrophes at the beginning of the word. Yes. Could you explain what you taught us? It's so cool. So whenever you drop letters off of a word, um, the letters need to be replaced. Like you can't just leave them gone. And so when you drop like G off the end of ing, you put a apostrophe after it. Well, you also put an apostrophe at the beginning of the word whenever you drop something. But the apostrophe has to be facing a certain way. Otherwise, it's wrong. And so you have to go through and individually change each one of those apostrophes because your text editor is going to make it face the wrong way. It's I can't so remember. There's a, there's a oh, I remember name the way because you, you had me. Yeah, I don't remember the name. But so all of them, like if it was like twas, we'll just use um, not twas. I don't know. Taylor, give me a word that this is the beginning. I removed the A from against. Okay. So against instead of against. So the apostrophe in words, if you're just using word, you know, like most of us do, it goes to the right automatically. That's what it does. Just like the open quotes, right? They just go to the right. So it went to the right. But as Sarah taught us, it's supposed to go to the left. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the only way to make it do that, which like it doesn't like can't, right? Can't, it'll go to the left automatically. Right at the end, like you said, like you said, Sarah, getting right. So at the end, you leave off the G, it goes there automatically. But for some reason, <laughs> it won't do it going to the left at the beginning of the word. You would think somebody, okay, where's Microsoft? We need to call them and tell them because how many times? So I told Taylor, I'm like, dude, we got to fix all these. She's like, we got to what? <laughs> yeah. I was like, Kelly messaged me and I was playing around with it and I realized I had to like actually write. Yeah. against and then put the apostrophe in there and then remove the a and i was like i texted her back i think when she told me this i texted her and i was like no <laughs> this isn't a real thing we don't actually have to do this right and then when i realized we did i just kind of closed my laptop and put my head down I was like because there were so many it took hours i was at denny's till like 2 a.m one night oh. fixing this I wish you had reached out because my idea was to control F uh, like all of the words that are missing letters and just can find and replace. You can do that. You can find and replace the one that's going the wrong way. Oh, I did that. So I did. So I did that. So I had to like put the A and then change it and everything like that. But the problem was that I had to make sure it actually picked up everything. So then I was going through and making sure that I hadn't misspelled anything to where it it took. I was like, oh my God, this is horrible. You did really well though. Like going through, I think you got 99% of them. There was maybe one or two that I had to fix, but I like, I was expecting to like be doing that the whole book because the author I normally work with his idea is like oh no I'm gonna write something and then the editor is gonna fix it um (laughs) and so you sent this to me and the fact that they were all facing the right way in chapter one I was like so impressed I'm like oh my gosh this edit somebody actually like listens to me all for you it was all for you that's right that's right that's right (laughs) we care about our editors we get it yeah we do (laughs) And if we want to keep you for the whole series, we can at least learn our lessons. <laughs> yeah, now I know. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yes, Kevin. So it kind of points to the missing letter from something from the beginning. But I mean, if it's in the middle of the word, it could be either way. So hence, we should be able to do it randomly because we feel like it. I think that's only fair. Yeah, you know. we're Shakespeare in this instance. We just do what we want to. That's right. I think that's fair. I keep saying that to my editor. I'm like, Sarah's I'm like, a writer. No. Why can't I make up words? Yeah, Sarah's like, yeah, no. you're not going to do that. And yes, then I, I let you do it anyway because the book's not in English. 
<laughs> this for ver- this version that's different right yeah so nope i get that i get that um let's see so i'm gonna ask some fun things tonight because this is still 20 questions even though it's a special edition so we have fun things we like to ask um so one is do you have a favorite editing error that you make by favorite i mean like it's odd like i always mix up glean and gleam and i don't know why and i don't notice it until i have to go back i have two um and one of them is one that you make as well kelly it's i instead of a i'll put i and I don't know how, yes. because they're like not in the same place on the keyboard. But instead huh? of saying like, it's a bird, I'll put it's a I bird or it's mm-hmm. I bird. It's I bird. Uh-huh. And I, I still haven't figured out why. And I haven't figured out how, but it makes me feel better that you do it too. Cause I'm like, I'm not completely crazy. Something happens. And then for some reason, I always, 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 always switch up it's with the possessive and then just regular it's. Everybody like it that. is. Yeah, Sarah's like, yeah. that's half my job. <laughs> Just like constantly. And I know the difference. I get that. But even when I go through and I, Sarah probably caught a ton of them. Even when I go through and I revise and I'm like specifically looking for it, I still just pass over it. I'm like, that looks fine. <laughs> Next. That looks right. <laughs> when, see, Sarah, when I'm job security. What do you yeah, see? No, when I'm what editing, <laughs> one of, when I'm editing, one of the things is I slow down and like actually think about it is whenever I run across it. So every time that you write it is or it's, I go through and I think in my brain, it is yada yada to make sure that's right. Yeah. So it just, thank goodness for you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> See, so there are still some things for like, Sarah will fix it. <laughs> yeah. She'll, she'll get this. We're, we're, we'll give you the cleanest that we can, fix what we can, but we're not perfect. I mean, if we were, we would need an editor, right? right. Yeah. No, oh, but- something else. We're about to sound like grammar nerds here. So with the, like, a Wait, possessive. Wait, are you trying to say that's a bad thing? With the, <laughs> maybe, I don't know. I guess it depends on who's watching. That's true. Um, but with possessive for names that end in S. Like, yes. Marcus, for the yes. longest time, I thought that you just put that apostrophe for the possessive, but then you left off that S after. So it's not Marcus's is, it's just Marcus's, and you don't. But then somebody told me that you do put the S afterwards. Maybe it was somebody who just coughed, but here's the catch. Here's the catch of this. This tells you how great of a teacher I am. I like, I really thought that I was right. Like 100% thought that everybody else did it wrong. And I taught my kids for an entire year, like had it on quizzes and stuff like that, that if it's Marcus and it's possessive, you just put the apostrophe. So there is a whole class of 160 kids that are out in the world right now. So Believing the, that their teacher, Mrs. Shepard, taught them the right way. <laughs> well, if you if you want me to make you feel better, it <laughs> is that way in some style guides. Some style guides say that you do not add the extra S, but if you're going by the Chicago Manual of Style, which is the big one that everybody uses in, in publishing, then yeah, yeah, you're going to add the, the extra S. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because they do that in Britain. If we have anybody from the UK here, that is how they do it in Britain. And I really believe that's how I was taught as a child, too. But things change, right, Sarah? That's one of the things you're going to keep up with. To leave the S off, yep. And they still do it that way in Britain. So when I get, like, stuff from the UK, I have to change. I'm like, okay, wait a minute. How do they do this again? Like, I have to look it up because it's all different. But, uh, yeah, Florida Kevin says, the world is doomed. Great job, (laughs) Taylor. At least you're not teaching your kids to use two spaces after a period anymore. Um, (sighs) In my high school, in my high school, I, uh, another girl that I I was in high school with, she would do two spaces after a period, never touched a a typewriter in her life. She had been in the digital age of monitors forever. So there's not even like, oh, it's word requires two after this period. So it looks right. No, no, no. Her, her English teacher as a 18 year old in 2018, um, was telling her that she needed to use two spaces after a period. And I was like, no, no, that's not how that works. Nope. That's one of the, like you said, it's an old typewriter thing. No more two spaces. No, you do not use two spaces. I had to learn how to retype because I was taught two spaces, even though I was still taught Mm -hmm. on a keyboard how to type, but it was in the eighties. So they hadn't adjusted yet. Right. So I learned and I relearned. So if I can relearn, you can relearn. And if you can't relearn, 
Control Sign H, change it all. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> just change them. Change them when you're done. It's fine. So you have a couple question mark ones you got to fix. It's fine. Just please don't send it to me like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. That's that's the rule. See, Sarah gets it. I love it. That's why we have you on board. Mm -hmm. um so now for our fun questions even though that was fun one i like that see all right more fun questions we have a a traditional one around here and since kevin already talked about ice cream let's do that what is your favorite flavor of ice cream (sighs) cherry cordial yes that's unique i like that one how about you sarah i like butter pecan butter pecan or cookie dough okay cookie dough is a classic like you just can't beat it yeah (laughs) except with cherry cordial i (laughs) I had a lot of fun working on the book because my family is traditionally from Texas. Like East Texas is where I didn't grow up there because I was a military kid. Um, But so there's a lot of Southern in my house. Um, And the whole time I was editing the book, like my soundtrack was Johnny Cash and June Carter. (laughs) I don't know if this got passed on to you, but I told Cal, I was like the entire time I had pretty much guitar picking a uh, long-legged guitar picking man on on repeat just listening to this murder book <laughs> <laughs> oh my god i love it <laughs> the i'm gonna have to bring the soundtrack back for the next one <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna have to keep modernizing it right yeah, yeah. you can listen to it during lillian's though because she's she stays pretty pretty consistent with her style <laughs> it's awesome yes let's see kevin says we try to keep the southern out of the house but the dogs keep dragging it in. <laughs> <laughs> they'll, do that. they'll do that what is jenny wants to know what my favorite ice cream is my favorite ice cream is usually mint chocolate chip but mm. i'm an adventuresome ice cream eater right like i like to go and try something new like, actually, butter pecan is what's in my fridge right now. But then I'll also buy mint chocolate chips. So in case I buy the new thing and it's gross, <laughs> I can throw it yeah. away. You know, I mean, it's too many calories to be tortured. So I'll throw it away, and then I can eat my mint chocolate chip and still be happy. And then you have mint chocolate chip for when you're done with the other one. Exactly, because that will <laughs> never go to waste. <laughs> like, I like how you're strategic even when you eat ice cream. I know, my stupid brain. What can I say? Um, let's see, favorite ice cream. Uh, dogs or cats? Oh, dogs. Sarah? I'm a cat person. Nice. I love it. All right. Um, what are the other one we have in here? Ooh, well, we have conventions coming up. So I'm wondering, Taylor, do you have like anything special that you want to wear as an author? Now that you are officially an author, you can, you can call yourself a writer all you want. You're still a writer. But you are actually now an author with your beautifully published book. Do you have anything like official you want to wear? When you go? Um, no, I hadn't thought that far ahead. What? I think you should wear that scarf every time. Even in the summer. What do, when it's what do authors normally wear? <laughs> oh, everyone wears something <laughs> different. That's why I ask. Like, do they have like a set outfit? And it's like, I always wear this blazer. Yeah, a lot of them do, actually. Some of them oh. wear specific hats. So if you ever see them with a hat, you know them from that. Some people wear, like, I always dress professionally. So I'm always in, like, you know, you've seen me, right? I'm always wearing, like, a shirt like this that's a, a professional shirt, nice pant, or nice pants or a skirt, and, you know, real shoes, which yeah. is really frustrating. <laughs> I'd rather just wear sandals all the time. Um, and real shoes, right? Because I have to feel professional in order yeah. to present myself in front of these people, right? So it's just wonder. And some people don't care. Some people wear costume. Right? Yeah. Like an actual, you know, this is their cosplay. They are now cosplaying as this character from their book or something. Yeah, like Todd. Jenny's talking about Todd. I was thinking about Todd, too. Todd always wears purple. You know, Todd has a, the purple tie and the, and the gray hat with the purple band around it and you, sometimes yeah. a dragon on the shoulder, right? So there's certain things that they do. So I'm not saying you have mm-hmm. to. You absolutely don't. Lots of them don't do anything. But I was just curious. Taylor's like, I've never thought about it before. I, guess I know. I- now, now I'm like, <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Now you've now you've written the book. Now, that's the easy part. Now you've got to actually sell the book. <laughs> I'm thinking. I'm thinking casual and approachable, like nice casual, like sweater and scarf. Yeah. See, I think it works for you. You have mm-hmm. the long neck, so I think a sweater or you know, a nice little scarf would be perfect. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that'll yeah, work. What about you, Sarah? When you go to to professional events, have you done any yet? Like since we've locked so- up. 
I I haven't done I've gone to a, like a couple of writers meetings but I've I've not tried to sell books at a convention before. Normally when I go to a convention I'm dressed up in cosplay and I've got two um I I really like Pokemon and so I've got a team skull grunt outfit and a Noivern pup uh, a Noi bat puppet and so he's you he, he, he's pretty tall he's he's a, like the size of a Noi bat if from the Pokemon game and he rides on my shoulder and he's got clips it's a magical engineering trash composite thing and I really like him um, but my other one is a six foot tall Noivern puppet. And there's pictures on my Instagram of me like hunched under this giant foam thing, walking around a, a giant Noivern puppet. And that's what I wear to conventions. That's so cool. That's awesome. That would be fun. I've never been brave enough. I love cosplay, just not brave enough. So, and I don't mean like I'm scared to do it, but I mean to actually make the costume that bravery. Yeah. Because, you yeah, know, people are so creative. I watch those videos and stuff like that of them, and I'm like, oh my God. No. And you could buy all that stuff. But first of all, I mean, that's not as much fun. And second of all, it's stupid expensive if you're going to buy it all. And it's expensive enough if you're going to make it. So yeah. I just haven't been brave enough to actually, you know, take out that soldering iron and get to it. One of these days. One of these days. There's there couple, are. There's, there's a couple of like. Co- um, closet cos- cosplays that you can do and that are really super easy and approachable like Team Skull Grunt is super easy because it's just like a sweatshirt, sweatpants and you paint an X on it and then you're good to go like everyone's got like their background characters uh, one that I saw recently was just we, we're we people who live in um like steampunky um Oh no! Uh, post-apocalyptic wasteland, and so they had like their little scarves on and the gas mask with bright orange dots on it. Like that's super easy. You could do something like that in mm-hmm. an afternoon. I do like the aesthetic of steampunk. There's something yeah. about it that's very appealing to me. I've always thought it would be fun to write a novel in like the steampunk world, but I don't know. It just never. I can get like a couple of pages, and then I'm like, meh. This isn't. This isn't what I I enjoy working for you. looking at it and everything, but it's just not for me, I guess, to actually create. Yep. Sometimes you got to experiment. I know. Yeah, it's really fun. So um, let's see. So Taylor, so this one is a uh, paranormal horror, Leather and Sage, and you have how many books do you think are going to be in this series? Asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> solidly four. Perfect. That'll be great. So a nice four to round it out to see what happens. Yes. So that's the fun part. So Sarah, having yes. edited this and edited quite a th- few things, who do you think is the audience for this book? Um, You're definitely looking at your teenage girls. Um, teenage girls is the audience for most books, but this one. It's um, also true. <laughs> um, so well, middle-aged cute. women too. We read a lot too. Um, I I would YA. I'm not going to say mm-hmm. middle grade because not for the content or anything. Like it's bloody, but it's not like graphic. And so, like you could give this to a 12 year old. It's just then you're teaching a 12 year old not English. <laughs> well, not only that, I don't think it's teaching them reading one book, but I think it yeah. is, it'll be harder for them to read, right? right? You want a little more experience with the language and reading before diving into this one. Because we don't want you to get lost. We want you to have fun. Otherwise, what's the point? We're not writing nonfiction. <laughs> Thank God, because no. these are scary <laughs> words. <laughs> no. Um, and uh, da, da, da. Pine Lord had suggested steampunk witches. Oh. There's a thought. That could be fun. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah, especially as you're moving like forward through the ages, like just throw a couple of extra gears in there and you got it. <laughs> yep. When we hit yeah. industrialization. And talking about Sam and Dean, anyone who likes Supernatural would it would appreciate this book as well. So it's very yeah, it's got the same kind of dynamic and the same kind of family. 
right? You know, family business for a reason. It's like very supernatural is very much about family and that kind of dynamic. So, so is this series. It's, it's even very got the shirtless muscular man. Mm-hmm. Well, there's the one. <clears throat> <laughs> But I can't talk about him too much because I'll give too much away. Um, uh, yes, that's awesome. So, Taylor, if you were going to tell people um, uh, your final words, what do you want to leave everyone with? Um, I just, you know, hope that you find something in it that you enjoy, really. And that it's kind of looking at what really makes a monster? That's the question that I had in my head the entire time that I was writing this. Because there's actual monsters in this, but then based on the circumstances and the environment that people are thrown into, they have to make decisions. And, you know, who the monster is, do we think that if she had been put in the position that she'd been put in, would she actually be this way? And you have the prophecy at the, you have the prophecy at the beginning that says she's going to be that way, but was it always meant to be or was it a product of abandonment yeah plus she was taught the prophecy Mm -hmm. so you know if you never hear a prophecy but if you're taught it yeah because she tries really hard to to be good Mm -hmm. she does Mm -hmm. so it's very interesting and very compelling i I cannot wait to hear what y'all um what y'all think about it. So Taylor, now that they all must have your book and they want to know more about you and they want to follow your newsletters, so they know when book two comes out, um, where can people find you? Um, you can find me, well, my website's under construction. It's been under construction for a really long time, but you can find me at my website or you can find me at on Facebook, just at my name, Taylor Shepard. Mm-hmm. It was S H E P E A R D for those of you who need it. And Sarah, if people would like to find you or follow you, where can they do that? Ladybird editing at gmail.com. Send me an email. Twitch.tv backslash birdie25. That's got the link tree to everything else Twitch, Twitter, Instagram, Discord, um, all those sorts of fun things. You can find me there. And Excellent. if you want to get a book edited, claim your slot now. I'm already half filled for. I've already They're claimed mine. She's, she's already claimed them all. <laughs> I just signed new writers. I might have to have another one now. Um, so, and if you um, want to know when we have new releases and all the fun that's going on, please join our newsletter at, uh, if you go to cursedragonship.com, a little thing will pop up and it'll say, you want to join our newsletter? And you're going to say, yes, yes, I do. And then just fill that in. And also you'll get a free e-copy of Laundered. So you'll get a fun collection of short stories for signing up. And I think that's it. But please, now, get the book, because you're going to love it. Review it for Taylor, please. Also, please review our podcast, wherever it is you get podcasts. And you can follow us on Twitch or subscribe on YouTube. And uh, please let us know if you have any other guests that you'd like to see. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye.